get the cough out first. <laughs> I get my inner acting skills. <laughs> right, hello everyone and welcome to the Sure Out Podcast. I'm your host Ross Baxter and today is episode 26 of the series and today we've got an incredible guest for you. We have level designer and actor Joseph Boone who works at 4J Studios. How are you doing man? Hello, I'm doing fantastically. Yeah, as soon as you started, my hands immediately got really sweaty oh, right, um, okay. and nervous. So yeah, it's okay, <laughs> man. No pressure whatsoever. Just be no yourself. No pressure at all. I'll just start bombarding with like hundred questions, like instant, instant reaction response. <laughs> Go for it. Right. Um, yeah. So everyone who's uh, tuning in uh, to the podcast, um, once again, everyone, we're. Uh, this is a podcast I do every week, so if, if you are new, um, just uh, just so you know, I'll be out every single week. I'm trying to, my best to try and get a few episodes out as much as I can. There's actually three episodes coming either tonight or tomorrow. I'll see how the internet wants to, if it's kind to me tonight. It normally takes ages, but fingers crossed it all goes to plan. Um, if you're new um, to the podcast, the podcast is live every week on nine other platforms alongside uh, YouTube. We are live on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and finally, Stitcher. Last but not least, don't forget to select the notification bell. That'll be much appreciated if you want to be notified every week when the podcast is live. And obviously, don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed today's podcast. That'll be super awesome. Um, but yeah, so um, as always, um, we're going to be talking about student education. And the really cool thing about Joseph is he's coming from a background um, that you'll find out it's completely different. He um, he's an actor as well, and um, we'll be able to tailor these um, like his talents into the conversation of student education as well. But um, yeah, man, um, thanks for doing this. This is going to be good. This is going to be really good. No problem, no problem. Really glad to be on. Uh, tuned into a couple of the ones previously. Um, a friend of mine and colleague Mike Brown, he was on recently and he uh, basically came to me saying, oh, Ross is looking for a different, more more people for a different sort of broad take on, on the, you know, the subjects that he's talking about. Would you like to go on? I'm like, yeah, sure. No idea what I'll talk about, but let's do this. <laughs> no, that's, um, that'll be cool. No, but that's, that's, the th- that's the thing, though. It's like when it comes to art, it's um, I think like the main thing when it comes to podcasts is or like the podcast I've seen is they're very like I understand, but they're very tailored to maybe like a certain subject, like they're very con- concept art based or they're very three D only based. Yeah, very a very sort of like acute scope. Yeah. When it comes to content. Definitely, and like I've always wanted to, um, like personally, I think everything is art, as cliche as it sounds, but like I could really bring in like a range of things. Like there's one thing I really want to do is like bring on like art directors and like um maybe one day dwell uh, into music oh that'd be cool because um I, I love music um love playing guitar and stuff so it'd be really cool to try to branch out a wee bit mm-hmm. but um yeah as always man so the obviously the the obvious thing just tell us a wee bit about yourself what do you do uh where do you work etc uh, okay so yeah. first and foremost um I am a what would the title team team level build lead thing. Uh, it's like I've at Four J Studios uh, who um, are based in Dundee, who de- um, develop the ever increasingly vast content that goes to the Minecraft console version platforms and um, expanding more into the Bedrock version as well. I uh, I'm a level designer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also lead a team of level designers as well. So all of the mini games, the mashup packs, uh, all of those levels that people uh, download and play through and have, you know, umpteen hours of enjoyment in some part of that level has been built by myself or the team that I help lead. Um, That's awesome. Which, which in of itself is such a weird vast concept I, I struggle to wrap my head around like you know this thing i've spent maybe eight or nine hours on mm-hmm. over the course of a day is now being played across the world that's insane to think about but that, that's the great thing though that's the awesome i understand where you're coming from like it's, it's mental to see like just to say that your art's in a game or in a film or whatever is like what a feeling yeah it's it's so bizarre to be like there's millions of people seeing this content yeah and they have i've got no idea who they are they've got no idea how who i am or who any of us are well maybe they know like the higher-ups who've been to minecon and things like that but it's 
it's such a, a weird amazing concept definitely but yeah it's so i that that's what i do that is my my, my day job uh, i work with a bunch of amazing multi-talented brilliant people who help develop this game um but as you said i i'm also an actor i didn't do any sort of formal game design training i never did uh you know like a, a master's course or uh any of that so all of my experience with game design comes from learning on the job and probably spending most of my adult and child life playing games um you can't go wrong there <laughs> you can't go wrong there no definitely great not. decisions yeah, um, but I, I I studied um, for three years at Dundee College doing mm -hmm. uh, uh, acting and performance course, which is more focused towards theatre um, and being on stage and that. But uh, after graduating, um, I have actually, ironically, I don't know if it's ironic, I don't know, um, but I've gotten a lot of voiceover gigs for Aberté students. Oh, right, um, right, okay, awesome. So Ross Baxter, who was on uh, previously, I did um, a voice for him uh, in uh, the game that he's he was currently doing for his his course, uh, which was great fun. He, he's amazing to work with. He just knows sound like the back of his hand, and it was just a pleasure to work for someone who knows exactly what they want yeah. from the people in the booth. Awesome. Like, um, so obviously you come in from like an acting perspective and so forth, but. So, so what made you want to go into level design? Like, what kind of inspired you for that? Well, it's it sounds a bit daft, I, th I think, personally, because I, I graduated from college. Mm -hmm. I was out of work for maybe two, three months. Um, and then I was working two jobs, one at uh, Greg's, everyone's top notch um Can't go wrong <laughs> bakery uh, awesome. other bakeries are available um and i was also working for a door to door fundraising company okay. as well and just both of those combined was just a, a bit soul destroying mm -hmm. and i was spending my downtime either trying to work on acting stuff or playing minecraft and my girlfriend um who went through Aberté, she she studied game design, um, she's got her, her degree in that. Mm -hmm. She applied for this job um, at a company called Forgery Studios. I've never heard of these guys in my life. I'm like, okay, what do they do? And she goes, well, they they make Minecraft for the console. I'm like, oh, oh so, so like the PlayStation and Xbox? Yeah, yeah, they, they make that. Um, there's... Uh, I'm not too familiar with Minecraft. Can you show me how to, you know, how to build stuff? So I sit down and I, I go through a couple of things with her, just kind of what I think looks good mm -hmm. in Minecraft, essentially. And then I think to myself, hey, this this sounds cool. I could be building for, you know, and and getting paid for it. So Definitely. I selfishly apply to this job as well, and. I end up getting it over her, which oh. makes, makes me ultimately feel so, so bad. Ouch. <laughs> but we've, we've had this conversation so many times, and it's like, yeah, uh, what I make is, you know, I understand the theory behind it. Yeah, no, no, but no, that's great, though, because like, um, when it comes to like um, everybody's kind of um, their own story, their own um, way of getting into the industry, like, I think there's still, like, there's a lot of people who think there's like one path, and and it's completely it's it's completely obviously not the truth. And mm -hmm. um, there's so many different ways of getting into the industry, whether it's through self learning like yourself, and just um, maybe a change of passion also um, just like yourself. And um, for example, you coming from acting and you finished that. Um, but the great thing obviously about you doing acting is that it provides a different perspective. And it also brings in um, a lot of story, a lot of narrative into, um, like, based off your experience, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm, so yeah. when you're creating creating games and stuff, I'm pretty sure when you're designing, you have, because obviously your imagination through your acting skills and stuff, you're able to, like, develop a story from that. So. Oh, most definitely, yeah. There, um, when, when it was level building, when I was, before I was, like, the team lead, I would approach it as to... Now, how would a player role play in this scenario? If say, say, if we were, um, we made 
mashup pack based on Fallout. Um, so the the Bethesda franchise uh, Fallout, and it was focusing on Fallout one, two, three, and uh, four, mm-hmm. and the little areas around the map that weren't specifically from the game. There was like elements where I was like, okay, so maybe a group of raiders has come in here and built it up. So what would that look like? Um, you know, uh, the other level designers were doing that, but from sort of a more of an art angle, as opposed to this will look pretty, these colours will look good together. I was more thinking of it as a as a player, I would come in here and I would put, you know, the workstation there and this is where I would grow my crops and that. Yeah. So it's it's coming it's the same angle when you look at it in a macro perspective, but in sort of a micro way, it's it's a definitely a different thought process. Definitely, like the, the, well, the great thing is, is like when you, so when you think about it, it's um, so there's so many different, I guess, um, how's, what's the best way for me to describe this? So everybody's creative, I guess, process that like you said, like everyone has like their own different take on different things, mm-hmm. and um, for example, like when you're creating, it's like um, I assume it's like almost like in a performance in a way. Um, yeah and when artists um when artists are working obviously maybe they have some sort of um story narrative in mind or like they have some sort of like do you know, do you know when you're like when you're just like geeking out and imagining about something like really cool like you have uh, your vision in your head yeah and you're just like i can um it's like you said earlier about people walking through your game like how would they na- like how would they navigate through the level and so forth like what are they doing and um, like they'll have like a certain image but maybe they don't know how to um i guess maybe describe it as uh, as best as you could like you're probably a lot better and a lot more um i guess straight to the point and that you have a better understanding of how to really drive the story forward Mm, and that probably comes from your your acting skills as well i'll I'll, yeah i definitely agree with that but i wouldn't say like me describing it is is better uh there's certainly several people at 4j who can do explain the same thing I can, but drawing it instead of speaking. Yeah. Because I I can speak to save my life. That's one of the, one of the few talents I'm very good at speaking. Perfect. But even then, I trip over myself a lot. But there's some people who will say one or two things, but what it would take me five minutes to say and explain, it takes them five minutes to draw a yeah. perfect visual representation of what they want and yeah it just goes back to what you're saying it's there's loads of different avenues to approach game design Mm -hmm. and there's loads of different avenues to like get into and that and it's there's no one right answer really from from my perspective at least oh no i I completely agree and and that's why i was um like the one thing i always believe is that everybody has a voice because i think the one mistake that like I, I even sometimes did it throughout my time at university, but it's do you know when you're asking for advice and people always think, oh, I need to ask the best person for the advice. Yeah. So, sometimes you just need to ask, like you can ask anyone because they see things that you don't notice, and like for example, um, like I ask my dad, um, sometimes, um, for example, I made this, um, I keep bringing it up on the podcast, but it's my recent art piece, so I made this train piece, and um, I was asking my dad, is there anything that you uh, just by having a quick glance, you think looks wrong, and he was able to like identify a lot of scale issues just by him, like his own perspective. Um, mm-hmm. Just because obviously, like everyone has their own opinion, and it's that this is the great thing about, um, obviously, like we're talking about, everybody has like their own take on things. Um, everyone has their own say, and it's it's important to um, acknowledge all these other areas, all these other groups, because at the end of the day, you're working with people, and um, that's the great thing. Like Joseph just said, is that. He's collaborating with concept artists as well, and through that exploration, um, you grow naturally as an artist, and that's the fun part. That's the that, that's the juicy part. Like that's the part where you enjoy it the most because you're working together as a team. Mm-hmm. It's just the the whole the whole um, produ- production aspect of it, mm-hmm. from getting from the concept stage to the finished product stage, is uh, it's amazing. We recently did our first. Um, pack for the Minecraft uh, marketplace, mm-hmm. uh, a pack called Seasons in the City, and essentially it is this huge metropolis city with like a couple of suburbs and like a beach area and industrial district, that sort of thing. And there are four different seasons that the player can traverse this map through. 
and there was a point where we were using command blocks which is like the in-game minecraft coding Mm -hmm. essentially you can put a string of these blocks together and it works like a string of code and it can you can get it to um, spawn things in. You can get it to clone assets. You can get it to play sounds. There's loads of different things you can do with them. And myself and uh, the one of the other build team leaders were sitting there trying to get this elevator to work, and just wasn't working. Wasn't sticking. A couple of things were going wrong. But we're getting there. We're getting there. And at the end of it, when we got them all working, we sat back and we thought, neither of us are coders. Mm-hmm. Neither of us are really artists i'm an actor and he's an animator but we got this to work you, you figured it out yeah we that's figured that's it out it, and it just yeah it just solidifies that fact that you don't need to go down traditional avenues to, to get things done definitely that's, um, that's, that's the great thing as well about minecraft is that because it literally it's almost like fortnite in a way in the sense that well obviously minecraft did it first but it's well i i might be any gamers <laughs> out there don't please don't get, start arguing at me but it's like, <laughs> when it comes to minecraft it's like it's infinite possibilities you can do with that game. Like, mm. You'll never run out. And um, like you said, there's like there's so many different things that could happen as well like, in a day to day that you, like, you'll have different challenges as well. And uh, but that's the great thing about Minecraft is that there's so many different things you, you'll be able to explore and try out new methods and stuff because there's literally like, you can do anything in Minecraft. Like I don't, like, I don't recall anything that you guys not been able to do yet. It's it's that powerful. I, I could I could rattle off a list, but those are company secrets. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll be uh, careful if, if what I, you say. Mm-hmm. If I told you, I, you'll have there to kill would me. Be a it. Oh yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Gee whiz, my podcast is going to be a lot shorter than I thought it was. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, trade secrets. Trade secrets. Trade secrets. Definitely. So the cool thing about today's podcast is, like we said, we can take it from Joseph's perspective of a level designer. So normally, I always ask the same four questions, such as. Um, what do you wish you were studying um, like for games and stuff at university and college? However, what we're going to do is tailor around the concept of level design mm-hmm. and base it around Joseph. <clears throat> so, first question, uh, Joseph. Um, if you were to study level design at university, what would you like to be teached? Oh. Um, I... So, uh, I, I, it's a hard question. Just, that is a that is a very difficult question, and I. Well, if you want me to make it of, easier, like it, what what's the main thing that you think a level designer should have? I think the main thing they should have is a sense of A to B, mm-hmm. as in you start at a certain point in. Let, let's talk as in like a. a classic progressive level like say uh, a level in uncharted or maybe um like a mario level where you get from point a to point b okay and that is the level i think what they need is a good solid understanding of how to get from a to b you know like going on different ledges across pits that sort of thing Mm -hmm. but also that they need to understand there's not one specific route there could be an easy route there's a medium route a hard route or there's like you know this um there's a, a different route that is very technically challenging, but it's also the quickest one, that sort of thing. I think, for me, when I've been building levels, um, traversability is a big thing that the art leads stress Okay. When, when we're building because you want... You, you know, you want it to be replayable, but not in the sense of, that was so fun, I want to do it again. Replayable in the sense of... Uh, I don't want to just take the same route every single time. Does that make sense? Yeah, Am I... no, that's a, that's a great point, yeah. No, carry on, that's awesome. Um, and I think that's really important because not only does it make the level feel fuller, it makes it feel more real mm-hmm. because, you know, you if you just go, say, you go for a walk through a park, right, and there is the, somebody has taken hours and hours and hours to plot out this park, put flower beds where they need to go, put trees where they need to go, put the bandstand where they need to go, put all the concrete paths where they need to go. But you look around those paths and you can see wonder trails going from one path to the other, cutting through the grass and that sort of thing. And it just shows that people are going to take the route they want to take. Yeah. And I think as level builders, we need to respect that. It's we the, need to respect yeah. whether that the player is going to take the route they want to take. Definitely. 
it's the it's the whole it gives it adds more story adds just so much more depth and um, mm-hmm. and it's like you said so the one thing um for example like i wouldn't call myself a massive gamer um in the sense that like um so obviously there's tons of gamers out there who like you'll like maybe buy games all the time and stuff like I, i've always been very i guess like i'm very particular with the games that i choose and mm-hmm. very um i guess repetitive as well like i guess i guess it's just a natural habit for some uh, a lot of people but like for example like um like i love games like uncharted but um like my main game is actually call of duty but um when it comes to like obviously like you said is that like for example in, in call of duty in, in blackout like i love to play blackout and um every time the drop's different it's the same as like fortnite everything's like changing all the time even though it's the same sort of idea it's a different way to make it more fresh yeah and it's it's the same like you said with uncharted it's like like if it was the same thing it would be um you'd just be frustrated naturally mm. and obviously obviously it depends on like the the level and complexity um, of the level itself but um it's that um constant uh, diversity that makes it interesting mm-hmm. it's when i'm i'm really sad that we we no longer do these for minecraft um on the console there was the mini games there was battle mode there was tumble mode which is just spleef for all those minecraft pc players out there uh and there's glide which is you know flying races um okay but the the battle mode was your classic battle royale um you'll start in the center there's chests for equipment and it's a battle to the death it's you know whoever is last mm-hmm. wins or like whoever scores the, um, the most kills i can't actually quite remember the rules um, sort of like T- but, is it TNT run similar to that? Um, it's not TNT run. It's more like the Hunger Games style. Oh right. Oh yeah. Hu- Mini games. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. So you all start in the center. There's chests in the center, and it's a mad dash to get the best loot and kill the other players mm-hmm. uh, to win. Um, and when we were building these maps, um, there was basically this unspoken rule where. Each building you made had to have at least three routes in and out of it. And each area had to have multiple ways to access it. And um, there had to be maybe at least three different levels of elevation the players could run from. So maybe like there was a ground floor, there was like a first floor, and then there was like the rooftops Mm -hmm. if you're doing like a city battle. And I think that's really important when it comes to level design because immediately when you've got those three tiers of, um, of height, and those, like, minimum three different entrances, it makes that level feel more alive. Because if you, you know, you, say you look at, like, a shopping centre, mm-hmm. there's not just one entrance in a shopping centre. Of course, yeah. There's, like, three, sometimes four, maybe five. There's, like, a couple of accesses from the car park. There's, you know, uh, maybe a northeast and a west entrance. And there's maybe two, three floors to this shopping center. There's that sort of thing. There's multiple different, you know, actual units where the shops are and they've got different aisles and you just sort of end up looking everything in like a, you know, it feels more alive when it's got all of these different routes through it. If, all those different does that, that make sense? Yeah, yeah, awesome. That's great. So when it comes to obviously, um, obviously the, like if you were studying at university, it would be basically making sure that people when they were doing level design they explored like a rate like the range so instead of just doing like a linear um path um like literally try all different ones and explore different ones yeah um, are, is there like like for example um when i was in alberta there was a habit of like obviously the level designers would be like drawing lots of different um like bird eye bird's eye view drawings and stuff mm-hmm. is there any sort of um things like else at university you think would be really beneficial for them to do to really increase their just knowledge of level design like is there any like small things that's helped you yeah well i i've used that the the bird's eye view technique as well i i I can't draw or save my life but that sort of aerial plotting out a map is very handy Mm -hmm. i've also find found cross sections to work very well oh oh yeah that's that's a great example so like doing like an isometric view of say a building Mm mm-hmm and then cross section that and be like, you know, um, say if you're taking like, you know, the tower, the Nakatomi Plaza tower, and you're cutting that in half, and you're sort of like plotting like all the air vents and stuff as well, along with the elevator shaft and all the different floors, you know, yeah. that like cross section of a building can show you. It just kind of oh, it's a different perspective on it, yeah. because when you know, say you're. 
I, I've got no idea how other games build their levels, but for for me, it was good to because um, sort of split a level apart just to kind of see flow through it and how how that works. Mm-hmm. And doing that either just using Photoshop or whatever really helped to sort of figure out the the layout of the level. Yeah. If that makes sense. And um, well, well, also carrying on one of the things that you said there, like one of the great things that you said. Um, like when you're doing level design, it doesn't matter like if you're like for example if your sketches aren't great. It's about exploring the different um, pathways to make the game more entertaining. Yeah, and, as long as you understand yeah. your sketches and your notes, that's fine. Exactly. Because you're not given those it, unless you're a concept artist, obviously. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you kind of need to know what you're doing. Yeah, you, you need to understand so those. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But if it's just your personal notepad and you're making like abbreviations and stuff like that, as long as you understand it, so do that's you fine. do you um, block out an engine at all? Like so, when it comes to like, do you like just go into like I don't know what engine you guys use or, or if you're allowed to say it in that, but like for example, would you go into Maya or, or 3ds Max or whatever and just like get like the cubes going and start just doing different pathways or like how would you approach maybe like a, just a base? Uh, we we don't use engine for it. We we actually build on the console version. Well, um, so, so you literally like, like layer on top of everything that's already there. Yeah. So oh, um, okay, okay. so essentially, what what we will do is, um, I'm trying to think how much I can say. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> I can I can, re- it, I can reword it if you want. <laughs> no, no. I, I'm. It's essentially what what we're doing is we will choose you know we'll, we'll have a brief for the pack and we will start with a super flat level mm-hmm. and just start building assets you know like you would you know just constructing assets in in Maya or whatever yeah um and then those will be um you know world edited into uh something else well we don't use world edit we use our own in-house tools Perfect. um to expedite things and make things quicker um but it's it's similar to those sort of things awesome. um and yeah, so we build in game, um, because it's it's a lot easier. I've I've seen people play about with like voxel editor programs and things like that, and I personally think it's easier for us to just build in the console version and then export that to the different platforms, um, because things just look different in Minecraft because you've got like your your, your FOV sort of thing that's a set number and um at least on console it is and yeah it just we we build in there um no thanks for saying that no sorry for the difficult question is it because i understand some um like every time i'm asking people questions like like i try to base it around student education but it's it's always about i guess making sure that when i'm asking you a question it's you're allowed to answer it (laughs) yeah no that's difficult uh, because um i I know, like, occasionally there'll be film cameras in and we'll have to hide certain things because yeah. it's under NDA or it's they're not going to be released for another month or whatever. You have to you always be, be careful of uh, what you're saying. <laughs> but um, Yeah, you are. Oh. It's, it's all... <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. <laughs> no, but... Oh, no, um, I... The awesome, awesome thing about, um, obviously, like, level design and stuff, there's, like, there's so many different things that we can cover. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I'll keep going back to um, the point I keep saying is that because of uh, your different perspective from acting, um, like obviously I know if, um, everything, everyone's different in that, but um, when it comes to like, um, like, I guess, level design as a whole, is there anything, I guess, you'd expect maybe universities to teach for you to be ready f- for the industry, for a level designer? It's like, like, for example, the common one is obviously like, uh, when everyone comes on the podcast is like networking and stuff but is there like anything that you think would uh, be more beneficial f- t- um, to make a level designer um, better does that make sense yeah well in in regards to networking that's just a thing you need to do that mm. that shouldn't be stated as a requirement because to progress in an artistic industry you're just going to need to network that's the that's the bottom line of it but in regards to the actual job of level you know once you're in there once you've got your claws in mm-hmm. when you're actually sitting behind the desk doing the design i think um obviously basic theory of like flow of a level okay and how how a level actually feels to play it you know if it is you know um a racing game like it needs everything needs to feel good when you're going at high speeds uh, that sort of thing or if it is say um a, the setting is like a dense jungle like th- the level around it needs to 
feel like that mm-hmm. um, because it's it's all very well having like amazing mechanics and uh, a really great narrative, but I think to, I think two of the most key elements in a game is how it looks okay. and how it sounds. Oh, that, that, uh, I did not expect that. Second, no, but I know I know what you mean. Awesome. Yeah, because uh, for for me, um, like if the the environment doesn't look believable, that kind of like draws me out of it a little bit. Mm-hmm. It, I believe I believable as in believable in universe. Yeah. So, you know, taking a, a, a narrative game like say um, uh, Uncharted or Beyond Two Souls or something, if something looked a bit weird, didn't really fit with the in uh, the the in universe, that would kind of throw me out. And I think level designers need to have an understanding of the whole of the game of yeah. like of like what the what am i trying to say like the, the what, what where the project's going if that makes sense yeah yeah because like, uh, so you guys have to like literally the, the scary thing about level design but what's also the great thing is because you have to take everything into consideration mm-hmm. um and that's the great thing i said to mike when he came on the podcast was that like i personally think um like uh, like sound is very overlooked at times Mm-hmm, and it's definitely like, it's like what you just said there about like when you said the point about sound like it, it makes so much sense because it, it has such a big um, like a big impact overall in the game mm-hmm. i for, for me sound is so important because not only as a consumer playing the game mm-hmm. but also because i'm an actor because i spent three years training and all that and because i want to be a voice actor that is my that's my goal um if, say, for instance, you're playing through a game and you've got a really strong voice for the the, the um, narrative lead, and you know there's a lot of emotion there, and they come to an NPC that's just like you know, stop, you have violated the law, you bl-, and it's very dry and it's a very sort of a quick throwaway performance. Even though it is only a small thing, mm-hmm. it does take me out of it, and that sound that, that that's down to the whole, you know, um, does the the voice director know what they want from this does you know the um has the person doing the performance given the best performance they can uh, so the, that will detract from the game for me a lot no no like, that, that, i completely see where you're coming from because um so obviously to like it'd be great to see so based on your point in there if um when it comes to like obviously i'm not an expert on all the courses that um like so I, i've been in four different like colleges and universities so i've gone quite uh, mm-hmm. I've been quite around. Um, <laughs> I've I've travelled all all the way around Scotland just to get my get my degree. But wow. um, based on your point, there'd be great if obviously everyone who's listening, who's a teacher and stuff, or um, an artist, whatever, to maybe have more coursework based around, I guess, how to use audio to drive the the story and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I assume there is a lot of that. But um, but I know you're going to make a point there. Uh, fire away. So I, it's sorry, I, I, you kind of cut there. So I just thought you were done. Uh, um, so I think something that's really important for not just level designers but anyone mm-hmm. is to understand how it all ties together, how the whole thing, you know, like how every aspect of a game ties together. Yeah. Um, obviously, bigger companies will know this because they've got X amount of years of experience. Um, but I've done a handful of voice acting things for Aberte students um some of them know exactly what they want mm-hmm. from the people going into the booth uh, some of them have got a good idea and some of them are just like oh, do do this see how it works that's always the fun one isn't it <laughs> yeah and it's and it's like okay but what what exactly do you want there's nothing to from, go with from me yeah it's even if they don't know have like an educated guess so say um the art directors wanting you know we want a jungle scene with a temple and the concept artist is like okay but what kind of temple go oh, just maybe like a mayan temple i don't know I, th- I think a couple of good educated ideas go a long way to not only producing good results just yeah. on the fly but like also expediting processes as well I, like that's that's the scary thing as well when it comes to like I understand um, sometimes it is the case when it comes to the industry like sometimes you'll be put on the spot and you won't really get given much information mm-hmm. but when it comes to making the pipeline 
work as efficiently as possible and make sure that nobody's like a bottleneck. Um, mm-hmm. It plays such a huge part just to, um, like, it sounds it's so cliche, but just being as um, helpful as you can. And being concise as well, con- yeah. con- being really concise through your answer really helps. One of the best bits of advice I was ever given uh, was from my first, my second year director, a woman called Jane Hensey, who uh, now does the, mm, I think, I'm, I don't want to say the, the level because I'll get it wrong, but she works at the um, uh, Scottish Conservatoire in Glasgow for the musical theatre. And we were we do a module where it's we're getting prepared to leave college and head to different universities and conservatoires to audition to get places on master's courses and things like that Mm -hmm. and so you go in you do your two or three pieces um whatever monologues you've got and then you get an interview and you just sit and talk and the panel will ask you questions you know like why did you make this choice when you were reading hamlet or you know why why did you set it like this and you know what's your motivation behind this character yeah and we were doing some mock ones and i gave one of the most bs answers <laughs> right. i could and and she looked at me for and she said there's nothing wrong with saying you don't know yeah an answer. and and yeah. and i think i think a lot of people need to do that Definitely. Just say, look, I, I don't know the answer, but let's try and workshop this together. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm really happy you said that. That's a that's a great point. Um, I'm trying to think. Has anyone ever said that on the podcast? That's the, probably the best podcast uh, point you've <laughs> anyone's ever made. <laughs> Brilliant! Ooh. I love it. Right. Yeah, it just uh, it's just honesty. Complete... You know what I mean? It's like it's so like I like I have mentioned honesty a lot before, but it's like so many people. Um, I'm not sure what it's like at 4J Studios, like I'm, um, because every studio is run differently. But do you like it naturally when people who, I guess, are students or whatever, or I guess it applies to any industry. Like, do you want you just want to do like you want to be proud of the work you do, and you want to make a good impression and stuff. But mm-hmm. um, you kind of get like, I guess, habits such as maybe taking on too much work or like you're too afraid to say no. Yeah, and it's 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 just such a crazy. Like for for example, myself, I'm very um like honest and just direct to the point. If you know what I mean, because mm. at the end of the day, I know it's about um it's the only way I'm gonna get better. So like um f- uh, one point I always mention is like um uh, growing up, um, I always played sport, and um I always said to my dad, uh no mark like obviously my, like my dad's always very supportive and very encouraging in that, but I always said to him just tell me straight to the point because because my dad was my dad's pretty good at sport. And um, I always preferred him being honest with me because it was the only way I ever uh, got better. Mm-hmm. And so many people, particularly artists, I know it's very hard to give feedback or um, admit to uh, certain things and stuff. But the more um, just honest you are, the easier it is for you. That's because when when you're in like an artistic position, like pride is pretty much interwoven with that. Yeah. Because you you're not just going here's a picture you're going this is as as corny and as cheesy as it sounds you are presenting yourself mm-hmm. and if someone doesn't like that you will take that personally yeah. on on any sort of level it, it could you either take it really to heart or you just kind of go oh okay that that's kind of knocked me back a couple of steps but yeah. you know and you will take it personally but that's like that's like the wording thing and it's also the the like the other point that um on the podcast is that you have to remember it, that like you don't own the work like obviously you want to make a good impression and you should have fun with it but it's about um it's a collabor it's at the end of the day you're working as a team and um t- like the feedback the more feedback the better and stuff like mm-hmm. i understand like um like, like you said particular artists um like maybe even for, like for yourself as a level designer like you design the level and maybe the the person in charge um, says, oh, maybe you have to uh, like completely start it all over again, or, maybe, <laughs> or take a different take on it. Like it can take a, it can it can be a big hit. You know what I mean? Like it could really hit. Oh, you it, like... it's such a kick. But at the same time, I thought it's ve- uh, you, you made a really fantastic point there. That no matter what I do, I try and use this. You say everyone's working as a team. You're all working on it together. I'm paraphrasing what you said there, but yeah. that was the general premise and. I think, for at least what I've heard from, uh, not not just on the Aberclay course, not to disparage them, um, but just some of the group projects I've I've heard can be 
you know, there's maybe four or five people in a group. One of them is really gung ho with it, uh, but a couple are just kind of dragging their feet a wee bit. Yeah. And All other I people end up have to pull the slack. I think, you know, and that that, yeah. that happens in any group project, um, especially at uni or, or college. And I think the quicker people realise that you're all a company, there's no one that is better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Like, sure, like someone can, you know, draw people better than another person. Sure, someone knows how to code better, but that doesn't mean you are any less worth than the other person. Yeah. Everyone is on the same level. Everyone's working towards the same goal. And the quicker people realise that. The better the work's going to be. I'm happy you mentioned the the the, the topic of the group projects because um, I completely understand uh, understand where you come from um, or, or or what you've heard basically. So um, so obviously I went to Aberté and um, absolutely amazing um, university. I'm going to actually be talking about um, Aberté on uh, on one of the podcasts uh, this week and wow. why I why I recommend to go there. Um, but you you made a great point. So the there's an awesome group project that every time um, you're in third year, um, sometimes fourth year, but it's mainly third year, you get the opportunity to work within a team. Um, however, there are caveats, and uh, Joseph just mentioned a big one. And it's, at the end of the day, obviously you always want to do well and stuff, and do, do your best, but like for example, I was on a group project, um, and the team I was on, I was actually pretty fortunate like I was, I, I really liked my team. Everyone who was on my team uh, was really nice, and everyone put um, a shift in. And um, at the end of the day, it's like, like this is where the honesty part comes in as well. And this is where you have to get um, get on. Like, uh, it's kind of kind of like a reality check of yourself. And um, like for example, my habit, I had a bad habit of. Um, I would love to like kind of do a lot of things myself because I knew I could get the work done and I trusted myself, and I always knew that I would I would be working all the time and I had in my head for some reason that um a lot of people were being lazy at times and um, but that's that was just me naturally at the time um because all I did was work, but when I stepped back and started thinking how how could I utilize my team better how could I maybe share the workloads and um i had a re i was really lucky as well i had a great team leader for the project called brian a uh, good friend and um brian knew how to make the team work efficiently but it, it, it all this thing um happens efficiently if you decide to work um as easy as possible with your teammates um or the people you're with and um coming back to the main point of honesty it's it it plays such a huge part and um Sometimes there are, there are people who work uh, who don't put a shift in, and that's when it comes to things like that. Sometimes you just have to maybe uh, you have to like tell people this person's not uh, working as um, hard as they could be or as smart as they could be. Um, but it's not about putting anyone down. You have to um, just be straight to the point. Yeah, it's it just goes back to being you know you're you're a team. You're there to support each other. You're there to get through the work together whether uh, that is you know a third year group project and you're yeah. you're all wanting to get your a or you know you're working on a triple a title and you're wanting to meet the deadlines you're all a team um and that uh, honestly that is something uh going back to the, the other question like you know what um i, I can't remember if you asked this because <laughs> this this conversation has been going a mile a minute for me it's, it's i'm so okay. excited about it it's awesome. but um it's cool. one, one of the things i wish i had learned at college or university is you know how to work as a team how to be a team yeah. lead how to be a producer how to be a manager because i i'm still guilty of this i've been working with 4g for three years now mm -hmm. um you know a brief 10-week hiatus but i will um <laughs> and one of the things i still struggle to do is trust my team okay and it's you know that kind of sounds a bit weird a team lead you can't trust his team what's going on i know exactly no, what you mean it's it's like I um, say, for instance, we're building a castle, and I've got two other guys. Uh, I'm I'm plotting because I start on usually like team lead will start on a certain project first, and then get people in as they're finishing off other things. Um, so I will start plotting out a castle, and then um, because I've got a specific vision in my head of how the castle should look, how it should be laid out, I will get someone else to go. Oh, just you do the walls outside it as opposed to trusting them to take my vision 
and put their spin on it and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so as I'm, you know, as I'm building up like the each individual part of the castle, the other person's like, okay, that's me finished the wall. What can I do now? I was like, oh well, we need some guns and that built on the on the parapets and that, and we need wall the walls fleshed out and walkable. So they do all like the the navigation and that and there, and I'm still sort of like doing the bigger task by myself, mm-hmm. which could be cut in half if I've got another person on that. Uh, that's something I've been actively working on as as a lead as you know just not even as a lead as part of a team but i think that's a very very important thing for everyone no matter what you're doing even if you know if it's if you're part of an acting company if yeah. you're part of a game design company if you're you know part of you know a sales team at a toy shop you need to work together you need to you need to not or yeah no <laughs> uh, you, you need to basically know know what you're good at what you suck at you need to know what you're your colleagues are good at what they suck at and you need to essentially know how to work together essentially it, it's crazy like um how so many people um like i understand there's like a lot of like for some reason there's always this crazy pride that goes on for a lot of people and i understand it like uh, like i've been a culprit of um a lot myself but like um oh, both like, <laughs> pardon <laughs> oh you and me both i'm <laughs> such a culprit for pride because it's like, unreal there's there's one um so there's one big um uh, thing that kind of um, broke me out of it when I was um, growing up, and it was uh, so I went on to like it was like a orienteering trip, mm-hmm. and um, I was assigned the task. It was for a leadership course, and I was assigned the task to basically navigate um, everybody up um, uh, the mountain um, and like through like all the terrain and so forth, and. The first thing I, I've all, because no, normally I'd be like, yes, I want to be the leader. I want to take charge. I want to say everything. But it was the first time I kind of stepped back and I said, right, who's the best at using a compass? Who's the best at reading a map? And I said, right, you go at the front, you take charge. And um, people would be like, but it's your goal to uh, to lead. But the best leaders, like the one of the best quotes I've ever seen was um, from uh, Steve Jobs. And mm-hmm. Steve Jobs basically says he would never hire. A, the, 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 um, I think it was Steve Jobs. Was it Steve Jobs? I'm pretty sure it was Steve Jobs. Um, he said that he. <laughs> the reason why he hires the best people, it's it's not for him to tell them what to do, but for them to tell him what to do. And it's being able to understand that everyone has an opinion, and everybody has a voice. So, like Joseph was saying, like uh, absolutely amazing point, is learn to kind of break away from the, oh, it's mine, that this is my precious um, um, item. God, I'm even using Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always think Lord of the Rings, I, I can't take it out of my head just thinking, God, I'm going, my precious. <laughs> well, so, sometimes during crunch, that is what it's like in the office. <laughs> oh, turn into Gollum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this Smeagol mode going absolutely mental. <laughs> yeah, it's Brilliant. scary, it's scary. No jewellery is allowed. <laughs> and... <laughs> You guys are just like, oh god, <laughs> just picturing the image right now. <laughs> god, just like stroking it. <laughs> yeah, um, it does get scary. Sorry, you were saying. Yeah, so it's uh, these are always the best parts of the podcast. So you, you got to have a laugh. <laughs> you didn't talk. But um, yeah, so like when it comes to um, Joseph's point, it's it's about realizing that everybody's there's going to be so many people working on one asset or one piece that. Say for example, like a great point, um, my uh, my last uh, guest made uh, Ruri, so he works at Frame Store, and <laughs> basically what he said was that if he was making um a model, there might be thirty people who work on that model. I know I'm exaggerating the number, but there will be a lot of people working on that model, and his model will be getting torn apart, and he has to learn to step away from, uh, oh that hurt, that hurts so much of you know what I mean? Like you have to just accept the fact it's about at the, end of the day making a great piece for the game so um, oh, talk, i cannot i cannot agree with that more but um that's that's so true it's a uh, it's an important thing so make sure to focus on that and it'd be great if uh to cover the main point that joseph said if when it comes to leadership and university and stuff really teaching how uh to to lead how to how to um how to work smart um how to collaborate efficiently um, are they efficient? Uh, being efficient is probably the most important thing, and that comes from uh, great communication skills as well. So, mm-hmm. like, there's a lot of different things that universities and colleges, like, um, I know a lot of them are maybe doing, 
but when it comes to group projects like th- this is this is a difficult thing because when it comes to the podcast so my focus obviously is trying to help um like i really hope teachers are listening to the podcast like that's my main goal is to really help improve the education system but the hard thing for them is because there's so much things that they have to teach and it's trying to get the balance but um surely that one point that we've just covered that's like that should be fairly explanatory it's, it's not too complicated of a thing to um add into a module mm-hmm. um even if it's a separate like maybe it's tailored towards networking or like leaderships like something like like that if you know what i mean mm-hmm. even if it's just like a couple of workshops through throughout a year or yeah. say say when you do start a group project um just having a couple of workshops with your team of like uh you know team building exercises as naff as that sound they really really help mm-hmm. and i think for me one one of the best things uh that this you know transcends just being a level designer but also uh during my acting um career as well um just learning to have fun with your team yeah definitely. well whether because there is nothing worse than clocking it at nine o'clock working with the people for seven eight hours button heads and then going home and then you're sitting there at home thinking oh so and so was a right oh today and, and you know she's not pulling her weight and uh, what was he thinking doing that and you just you let that negative energy build up but when see even if it's just you know going to the pub after work and just sort of speaking to people as people as opposed to you know you're my sound designer you're my my, my concept artist yeah. I'm, I'm the project lead you know just breaking down those barriers as well and just and just ultimately remembering that everyone's a human being yeah and yeah. they're all dealing with their own stuff and also trying to work towards the school it's just you know just you know love each other man <laughs> yeah you, you got you, you, no it, it's it, i know you're laughing but it's, it's such a great it's, it's such an important thing because at the end of the day it's uh like you apply to these places and um, you've gone down the route of a, a game career or a film career because you're, you're passionate about it and you don't want to ruin that opportunity or take that um, that pleasure away that you're having because of um, a fallout with somebody um, mm-hmm. just over something stupid. Because at the end of the day, it's like like one of the great things that I love about um, the Arbiter did and um, obviously uh, what my lecturer did in Edinburgh um, Ian is that like he's done like things that involve outside of university or outside education. So well, I know it's so the thing Arbertay does is still like Arbertay, but it's so like they do their game jams and stuff. Yeah. But it's more of a like let's all um, geek out and have fun with it. You know what I mean? It's not like like obviously people want to do well when they're doing it, but it's all about like having a blast, eating pizza while you're making games, chilling mm-hmm. and. Um, making friends and stuff and mm-hmm. it's a point that everyone who like literally all i think 25 guests on the podcast have said so far it's like you you want to make a good name for yourself and um and just have fun it's like it's it's so it's, it, this is the thing that frustrates me so much is like so many people stress out about so many different things and i'm just like sitting here super chill like i'm just having a blast making art <laughs> Yeah, it's the the um, my girlfriend has done several game jams mm-hmm. um, because she knows what she's actually doing when it comes to making games, um, and I've I've seen some of the things she's made, and you know it's like the the things that people make are it's nowhere near finished, it's nowhere near you know polished, it's it's cobbled together, yeah. it's got you know like arms and legs and all these things, but the team looks so happy with the finished product. Yep. Yeah. And it's because, as you said, they've just sat there, at pizza, had fun. It's that solidarity, mm-hmm. that that camaraderie that that happens when doing a game jam. Definitely. And and that 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 fun is such an important element of the team exercise of um, collaborating with other people. Um, and and by having fun, I don't mean you know like muck around and slack off, but it's like you know, not being afraid to you know just try things yeah and knowing that your team of four or five people who have your back mm-hmm. and that's that's really good and i think for for group projects at Aberte, i do think that the thing that needs to be stressed is one person can't carry it oh completely agree yeah there's no, there's nothing worse than you know you know playing on lines with your mate 
mates and like you know you're carrying the team but as soon as you go down they're like oh no we'll come back you you can respond by yourself mm -hmm. there's you know that's a pain you've got you've got to carry each other you've got to make sure you're all you know collaborating and I, that is something i don't think i can stress enough because like the the one issue that i i saw a lot of um people um make when it came to the group projects so um it's a similar point so i had a um a great guest uh, on called uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob Clausen. He's an environment artist. He's an environment artist at Ubisoft. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was talking to me about his group project when he was at university. And he said the the habit or the mistake that he made when he was doing it was that basically him and his best friend who were part of this group were always working at home or together outside of the group. And it's... Like, I understand a lot of people have their own... Um, their way of... Uh, how could I describe it? Um, like they have their comfort zone, and um, yeah, they've got they've got their own flow of working. Yeah, definitely. And um, he said that he wished he worked more within the team, so it, it just felt better. Mm -hmm. And um, um, it's exactly what um, Joseph's saying as well. Just now, it's about making sure you're a part of it because it's the part that's going to be most rewarding. And knowing, like, there's nothing worse than knowing that you've not tried your all. And um, Imagine being the person who um, held everyone behind or caused everyone to be a bottleneck. It's, it's not a nice feeling. Like, you should be, if you're applying to a course and you're in your third year, fourth year in university and you're working, you should be, uh, like, personally, you should be working your butt off. And, like, obviously, um, you should be having fun and you should be, obviously, putting so much stress on you, but you don't want to be putting extra pressure on other people just because um, your lack of respect for their work. And I think some of that does come from I've I've certainly spoken to people in the course who take themselves very seriously. Yeah. So I am a game designer. This is what I will do. And it's like you, you need to have a bit of humility. Yeah. Be a bit humble with it. It's like yeah, you, you know, you you want that is I can clearly see you're super passionate about this. However, there's a point where it goes a bit too far and you forget yeah. how to have fun with it. Because you're so focused on that end goal, you're so focused on that. There's no consideration for you know the journey, the the process, is it? Because yeah. sometimes the process of making it, sometimes that trial and error are, can be so much fun. You can learn so much during it. So um, obviously, carrying on from, um, from this point, uh, that was that was awesome. That's that's a great part mm. of, the, uh, of the section. Um, yes. So right, this is this is gonna be a, the. This might be a pressure question, so okay, <laughs> right. Quick, so, I've got I'm buzzer at the ready. Right, okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right, is um so when it comes to obviously uh, the podcast, I always talk about like um like the best materials probably to help you. Um, for example, you're a level designer. So, is there anything, tools wise, website wise, or anything that maybe uh, you could recommend, or any sort of um tutorials or anything? So for me personally, um, working on Minecraft. For me, consuming uh, as odd as it sounds, consuming as much people-made content as possible. So whether that is on the Bedrock Marketplace, looking at what the other companies are doing, uh, whether that's you know watching a well, actually no, I can I can directly say this. I learned how to build in Minecraft from watching YouTubers. From who who know the theory? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, like awesome. so people people like uh, B double O or Corralis or uh, Etho, um, those people these these guys who have been playing Minecraft since it's since it took off essentially yeah. or before that I um they they know how to build they understand the the theory behind it the in game logic behind it mm -hmm. what looks good what doesn't and um for people who maybe just want to build better in minecraft those are the sorts of things you should be you should be looking at yeah. um for level designers and that i think consuming as much of the media as possible um even if it's not just playing the game like you know play a game sort of like see what they're doing with it you know is it one of these games that uses light to draw attention of the player so they know where to go is it one of these games that has all these different nooks and crannies that you have to properly explore through like like a souls game um is it you know is everything interconnected are things you know standalone you know just consuming as much media as possible just to give yourself a broader scope of it because if you're working within the same circle all the time not only is your content going to get stale you're going to get stale yeah you're going to get bored with the stuff you do and that 
initial flame, that initial passion that you had for it, is going to dwindle. That's so. That's where like the range, like range, is so important. Yeah. And um, well, like that's another thing because like so many people get stuck, like you said, like um, like so many people get stuck in the same thing. Um, for example, I'll, like I'll keep uh, relating back to myself because we have our habits now and then. So um, at the moment, I'm very uh, I don't know. It's like for some reason I'm obsessed with airships, mm-hmm. uh, airships and like uh, things that are floating, and um, then. Uh, so the thing I always do is um, when it comes to this portfolio, I always make sure that the 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 next piece is like a contrast um, of what I've already made. So mm-hmm. um, like I'm making a piece at um, at the moment. It's um, I don't want to go into too much depth because I I, I want people to show, I want to uh, kind of surprise <laughs> people when they see it. But yeah. um, basically, it's very nature orientated, mm-hmm. and um, it's um, like uh, Joseph's saying, it's about trying different things and. Um, literally, like, when it comes to level design, it's the same for concept art. There's infinite possibilities. Like, there's so many different routes you can take. So many different research out there. You've got so many games to play with, and um, so many different genres. And that's another thing. Like, genres, like, that, that's probably like that's a massive one when it comes to, I guess, just game oh, design. Totally, totally. Like, the genre is so important to how the level design works. I mean, for instance, say, look at look at something like uh, an action adventure game compared to a horror game look at like how different those levels are but also so looking at the similarities as well yeah it's really interesting you know how how do these overlap you know the, w- the one thing that always gets me so um um i love resident evil games mm-hmm. and every time they scare me all the time like i'm not i'm not afraid to admit it every time i'm terrified of resident evil <laughs> Like I'm playing it. Like my favorite one's Resident Evil Four, and the most mm. common thing it's it's so cliche, but every time it's getting closer to like a like a like a boss or whatever you're fighting, the corridor gets cl- uh, slimmer and slimmer, and I'm just like, yeah. and like uh, like the lighting, like you said, it's getting darker or whatever, or it gets quieter. It's like all these subtle things that through the level design, just makes like my heart beat. If you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And I also think another another thing, sort of harkening back to what is good for people to learn i personally this is how i do things don't be afraid of tropes tropes are brilliant tropes are they are familiar they're comforting as soon as someone like twigs that you know you're doing ah there's a jump there's a jump scare scare coming up Mm -hmm. they sort of relax into it and suspend disbelief um it's i'm and i can't believe i've gone this long without mentioning it but i i sort of do game design from a, a different perspective like uh dungeon mastering because i'm massively into D okay oh, nice. because not only does it allow me to sort of act but doing different voices and stuff mm-hmm. and like sort of entertain that fantasy mindset i have but i really enjoy the design element of it so like you know designing dungeons and things like that and you know designing creatures that my party can fight and some of the best things i've run have been when i have played to type played to trope you know like you know what's inside the crypt skeletons and the players are like oh yeah we get to mash some skeletons this is going to be great and and as as soon i for me personally in my own experience as soon as you're playing to type as soon as you're playing to tropes disbelief is suspended and the players can just have fun whether that's in a game or in dungeons and dragons or like say in a play when you know it's clearly a She's going to fall in love with him, and they're going to fight in the middle, and you know they're going to be wed by the the end of the end of the play, that sort of thing. And it allows you to look at different things as well. You're gonna, you're probably gonna give me a right when I say this. What does trope mean? <laughs> trope. Okay, so, I, so I, I, I'm, I'm just like everyone's probably just like Ross doesn't know what this means. I'm like, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so- so sorry uh so a trope it's like it's like a cliche you know it's like ah, right, uh, okay, that boy, makes boy meets thing. girl boy meets girl during spring break girl falls in love with boy boy's kind of aloof but in the end boy goes to girl in the rain with a boombox playing you know everything uh, makes i sense want then. it that way yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> when you were mentioning the skeleton in the thing i was like I'd, what point is he going to make you <laughs> I, I was just like gosh there's a word i don't know i don't know i don't i don't yeah. know what to say <laughs> I, I, I've got a habit of just using words, fancy words. <laughs> I should have just went along, but I should have been like, mm-hmm. yep, yeah, I understand. Com- it's completely like cliche, makes sense. That's right. Cool. <laughs> no, that's awesome. No, like, cliche, it's like, uh, like obviously, like, cliche, like, it's so important. Like, sometimes it, uh, sometimes it's okay to go with cliche. It's a balance, but um, 
so many people. I, I that's that's the thing that frustrates me the most though in so many games. Like um, same for films as well. Like there's so many films these days that I just already know what's going to happen, mm-hmm. and I'm just like. Like for example, a great film that I am um, that I love um, that com- completely caught me by uh, by surprise. Have you ever seen Swordfish? I haven't. No. Oh my gosh, it's one of the best films I've ever seen. Um, it's um, John Travolta, and I, th- uh, I think I know the one. Yeah, I just haven't seen it. So it's John Travolta and uh, Hugh Jackman and Halle yeah. Berry. And right, this is a spoiler alert. Um, well, do you want me to mention it? Uh, go for it. I I don't mind knowing spoilers in films. You're okay with that, right? So unless this... unless it's like a Marvel film, then no, that's fine. Oh, I, go I've, for it. I've not seen Endgame. Uh, yeah, I've seen we, everything. We will stay stum about it. We won't speak about Endgame. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in this film, oh my gosh, it's it's weird. This is like the first and only film I've ever seen this happen. But it's the first film that the baddies actually won. So basically, what happens um, is so basically in the film. They're um they're computer hackers, mm-hmm. and Hugh Jackman is hired to basically um hack into this system uh for John Travolta who's the bad guy, and Halle Berry is um actually uh like is pretending to be like an FBI agent, and uh, she's actually working with John Travolta, and mm-hmm. um, she's actually his uh like wife or girlfriend in the film, and um of all the films like you uh. So basically, as it's going into the ending, it's pretty much um, so. John Travolta, uh, um, his body's burnt; he's all destroyed and stuff. And uh, basically, uh, everyone thinks the bodies are dead. And then um, the, it's fading in, about to go into the credits and stuff. And then it's like twenty, uh, it's like I don't know, two, ten months later or whatever. And John Travolta and Halle Berry are on a yacht. And um, people then um, there's like a part a, a scene as well that um, basically what John Travolta did, he, him being so intelligent, he made like a, a duplicate of himself, like a clone. Ah. And he like got all the prints, um, so he like, got his own prints and stuff. Um, I don't know how they did it, um, but and put it on the body, so they thought it was real. And it's the first yeah. time I've ever seen like a like a film have like a body properly win, and it be completely unexpected. Because mm-hmm. like so many, so many films and so many games that I play, I've always like. For example, I know like I'm a massive fan of Call of Duty, but I always know what to expect with Call of Duty. If that makes sense. Yeah, you you, you play enough of a genre, you watch enough of a genre, you know what's going to happen. What what's going to happen? Yeah, like it's there's so many films that you know more sort of sci-fi or like superhero films that it's just the hero's journey reskinned. Mm-hmm. It's all the hero's journey. Yeah. And that that's probably why Infinity War was such a good film. Because it's not that. Because it's, you know, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen Infinity War. Skip ahead okay, 10 as seconds. Lo- as long as you don't mention Endgame. <laughs> no, I won't. Cool. Well, Infin- Infinity War, you've seen it, right? Yep. The bad guy wins. Yep. And that that's why the film was so good. It's such a good standalone film in itself because the bad guy wins. Mm-hmm. The heroes lose. It doesn't play to type. I think that's cracking. It's just like... I just wish there was more constant variation of it. Like I understand a lot of people maybe choose a game or choose a film. Um, like I understand everyone has like their their reasoning for going for certain genres and stuff. But like mm-hmm. the big point I'm trying to make here is that when it comes to level design, really try and explore and think about how to really catch the person off uh, off guard. It doesn't mm-hmm. always have to be a um a surprise. Like sometimes the best surprises are ones are. Uh, um, this is me almost contradicting my, myself, but it's like is the obvious one. Like it, but it's, it's all down to timing and how you set up the yeah. the, the, like the the level itself. The, this whole subject is such a contradiction because you can endlessly say, "Don't play a type. Don't play a type. Do yeah. something new. I'm going to do something completely new off the wall." Mm-hmm. But that only works if you've got a healthy balance between doing what's expected. Yeah. So you've it, it's such a juggling act, and there's there's no right or wrong answer. To this because like there's it's just kind of what feels right for for the, the the product you're making yeah like um before we finish up like uh, like the last one that um i was um like i'm happy you said um uncharted earlier is like um like the music plays a big part in like for example uncharted 4 um when i was playing that game like the the scenery changes all the time there's like four or five 
main sort of like areas like there's the the jungle there's the city there's like the desert sort of area like there's so many different areas mm-hmm. and everything has like a different pace and that's where the music comes into play and like the direction changes all the time but um like that's the beauty that's the beauty of level design it's like you have that power and ability to explore your imagination um as mm-hmm. much as possible but um no but that's that's been awesome um yeah. Is is there anything else you would like to bring up um personally just maybe off the top of their heads before we finish? Oh, I I don't know. Um I know we've I, mean, I know we've covered like, it's been a great podcast. Thanks for doing this by the way. Yeah, no worries. It's it's an absolute pleasure to do. It. I I like giving my insight on things even if, you know, you take it with a pinch of salt. Um I think with with more audio design, I think being being true to your source material is really important Mm -hmm. and being you know um and just sort of making things feel really fleshed out and really um alive and but also being very conscious of the genre of your and and the overall theme of your game uh one of if i if i might just sort of wax lyrical about a game I've recently played. It's this. Uh, I don't know if you if you played it. It's um, a game called Hollow Knight. Oh no, I've not heard of that. Oh, you, if you love music and sound in games, you need to play Hollow Knight. I shall give it. A it's go. got it's got one of the best soundtracks I have ever heard. Awesome. Um, because the overall theme of the the game is sort of just like this, like things are ending, and the soundtrack perfectly reflects that. Mm-hmm. It perfectly reflects that melancholic feel of the game it's much like much like dark souls in a way okay. where I, I like dark souls where the you played dark souls one i not believe it or not <laughs> oh okay um i haven't either but i only know this because i like watching 8-bit music theory on youtube okay uh, oh, as a guy who I've reviews heard... music in yeah, yeah. games and that and he speaks about the final boss of dark souls one mm-hmm. and it's not this climactic fight it's a slow theme because in essence, what you're doing is you're putting someone to rest, as opposed to, you know, saving the princess, killing the dragon, yeah. sort of. And I, I think it, that's such an important thing. Whether it is in, you know, um, games or film, some of the best films have no soundtrack at all. Uh, one of my favorite films is a film called We Need to Talk About Kevin. Gosh, there's so much I need to catch up on. I've never heard of this either. This this is an indie film. It's starring um, Tilda Swinton. Okay. John C. Riley mm-hmm. and oh, what's his name? E. I think he was the guy. He was the guy that played Credence in oh, uh, oh, it's right. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Me. Uh, not it's... Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Him. Um, yeah, uh, I know. I know who you're talking about Ezra Miller. That's yeah, his name. That's the one. Um, done. And we need to talk about Kevin. Is the story of this woman who meets a guy and has a kid with him, and that's all I'm going to say. Because it's such an intense film and the best bit about it is I can't remember if it's the DVD menu okay. or if it's the start of the film, you hear this sound. It's like sort of sound. What? Right, okay. And you only know what it is until the end. Gee whiz. But it keeps cropping up. If I remember the film correctly, it keeps cropping up. Yeah, but that's the thing, it's like like when it comes to like story and narrative it's it's the so it's the small things that are so massive and um like that's the thing when it comes to um like his point that he's making there just remember it's not always the big bold obvious thing that you have to make it's the it's the small things that just really get the mind racing if you know what i mean yeah as if if you're making your your audience think about the product you're making, mm-hmm. then they're doing half the work for you. Perfect. Because they're going to speak about it. They're going to pass it on. They're going to recommend them to your friends. Um, and sometimes the best things are not, you know, 10 pages in scope. Yep. Some of them are maybe just a paragraph long. And awesome. I think, I think, yeah, just being... I think if the one thing I could... From my limited knowledge of the game industry... I think one of the best things that any game designer can do is make something that they are passionate about. Mm -hmm. And even if that idea is the daftest idea under the sun, 
just try it. Just yeah, just give it a go. Because just go for know. it. Yeah. Awesome. But that's it. Yeah. That's that's a great a great point to finish on. Um, thank you so much for coming on. By the way, man, that's been a pleasure to talk to. Well, thank um, you very much. It's, it's been a great podcast. Um, if if you have any social medias that you want me to share, I'll put them in the comments below. Um, yeah, it just just my Twitter. That's all I've got so far. <laughs> Twitter, awesome, happy days. So and every- if and and if anyone wants to needs voices in their games, just feel free to hit me up because in in Dundee's more easier. But yeah, I'd I'm always up for voicing things in games. Awesome, if need be. Can't beat it. No, it's 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 been great having you on, man. Um, yeah, cheers. Thank you very much. If you guys are uh, tuning in, uh, like I said, uh, make sure to go f- uh, follow uh, Joseph on Twitter. Um, you'll be you'll see it spammed all over um, the background right now. And, um, <laughs> I'll be putting it everywhere on social media, so um, you'll be ready to see it. Um, and if if you haven't already, go check out some of Ross's earlier podcasts uh, because you can learn so much from them just through these little conversations between artists. Just listen to as much as you possibly can because you'll learn something from the little corner you didn't think you would. Thank you so much for saying that. It really means a lot, man. Um, if you're tuning in, uh, like I said, uh, at the start, I'd be much appreciated if you subscribe. Um, we're, we're on our way to 2,000 subscribers. So uh, thank you for everyone who's been um, helping out and um, being a part of this journey. Um, if you want to um, be notified about everything, about the podcast and so forth, um, check my Twitter at Ross Bax- uh, Ross Baxter Art And... Um, um, I'm actually going to be, like I said, uploading a few more podcasts this week for you. And, um, but until then, I'll see you guys in the next video. And uh, thanks once again, and we'll see you later. Bye for now.